Hi, everyone. Welcome. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, reproducible builds uh, at Sidora Labs, where I work, uh, and how we do it, especially with uh, using BuildKit and our in-house tools uh, called Builder and Cress, and some other things. Um, first of all, let me start with uh, Sidero Labs. Uh, let me talk about what we do. Uh, we are the creators of Talos Linux. Uh, maybe some of you heard it, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a Linux based operating system designed specifically to run Kubernetes. It is, run, uh, it, it is built in a Linux from scratch mentality from ground up. So our uh, PD1 is written in Go. It's called Machine D, it's not System D. So if you want system D, you have to go to the other room. Um, it, it is really minimal with uh, 12 binaries, and uh, it needs only, uh, it requires less than 100 megs of disk, and uh, it is an immutable root file system, uh, no SSH, nothing like that, and it's uh, free and open source. And we have uh, another main product called Omni that's uh, SaaS to manage Talos machines um, at scale. And uh, it, it gives like cloud-like experience on your own hardware, and it simplifies uh, management of clusters like upgrades and backups and cl all the cluster management via API and via web UI. Uh, it, its builds are also reproducible uh, as most things we have, and it is uh, licensed under business source license. So why do we do reproducible builds? Why do they matter for us? First of all, as we do Linux from scratch, uh, we want to do it the right way. We anyway need to build lots of software uh, to, to make Talos possible. Uh, why not do it the right way? And uh, second thing is uh, being security first with this minimal attack surface and all that stuff is a differentiator for us and our clients really care about uh, uh, the whole uh, chain of trust story. And Talos is really uh, very uh, commonly used in on-prem and edge uh, locations. So uh, this chain of trust becomes a bit more important. So we well, do signed commits that are not GitHub signature, but every commit is signed by a person using a hardware. And uh, also we do reproducible builds where possible. Um, another reason is um, sometimes third party software that we build can move around, change locations, and sometimes even disappear, the, the source archives disappear. So uh, how do we know that they are not changed? Like, like one example of it was XZ, actually. It, it changed its location uh, recently, and uh, we, we could verify that, actually, uh, the, after building the final artifact was not changed. And also, it opens the door for future improvements that we have as ideas that are like uh, using kernel's IMA to actually check on file access that if, if, if a binary, let's say, or if a, if a binary that we built is exactly matches the hash uh, and otherwise just don't execute it, that kind of uh, ideas are there. Uh, but we don't, we don't do it yet, but we could. Uh, so let me go with the overview of our tooling and how this look like. So, uh, first of all, we built uh, some very um, base tools called uh, in, in Toolchain. There we have GCC and uh, Lipsy, like Muscle, and s s some utilities to be able to build the, the tools that we are going to use to build actually the packages that we ship. So uh, in Toolchain, we have the, 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 the most uh, basic stuff. And then in the tools, we have like Bash and Make and Golang because most of our code base is in Go, and so on. Uh, tools are, tools uh, depend on tool chain. So uh, we use tool chain to build, build tools. And then we have packages that are the, the things that actually we ship in our various software, including Talos, mainly Talos, but not only. Um, and packages are built using the tools that we built. And then we have some extra utilities used by Talos. and. Uh, we have what we call Talos system extensions that, uh, and they depend on the packages. So this is the high level overview. If we zoom in to the tool chain, here the, the green ones you see on the top are the, the things that we uh, take from Alpine Linux like to bootstrap our build process. So we kind of trust them. Uh, 
I'll talk a, uh, a bit more about it later. But overall, we start with these things, like make and uh, build base. And then we build, uh, well, as you see here, muscle and GCC and so on. And we create, at the end, one uh, artifact. It's actually a container image called toolchain. And uh, this toolchain is reproducible. And we have uh, reproducibility checks in our CI to, to actually verify that. Um, then uh, we can have a look to the tools a bit. Uh, tools depends on the tool chain, and it uses it. And it, it also takes a couple of stuff from Alpine. Still, uh, actually, uh, some of these things can move to tool chain, uh, especially make, for example. But yeah, that's something that we want to do at some point. But yeah, this is a simplified version of tools. The actual graph is uh, actual uh, uh, tree is dependence tree is huge. But yeah, uh, I simplified it so. Here we have like Python and curl and git and all that stuff. And again, it produces a single artifact called tools. And again, it is reproducible. So nothing, in, nothing here is uh, shipped in our software. They are just still the tools to be able to build stuff. And finally, we have the packages. Uh, it uses tools. And uh, as you see, on the left side, there's the kernel. And uh, it is separate from all the other stuff. So on the right side, we have the same story, uh, mostly, that we, we, we built various packages like OpenSSL and UDFD and so on. And we create this uh, reproducibility uh, artifact, the image. But it's actually a synthetic image. It's not something that we use. But uh, using uh, this image, we uh, check our the reproducibility. So the only only software that are reproducible actually end up in the reproducibility target. The kernel, though, is kernel and the modules. Uh, there are like a few modules that we built. They are not reproducible. I'll talk a bit more about uh, more about it a bit later. But uh, most other stuff are reproducible. So how do we build this stuff? We have our in-house tool called Builder, uh, and it is basically. Uh, Reading a directory, uh, directory stru structure looks like the one on the right. Uh, it reads it recursively. It, it expects to find the package file, the one on the top, um, in, in the root of that directory. And then it recursively scans and uh, checks the directories containing uh, package.yaml, pkg.yaml. And every package is uh, build instructions for a specific piece of software, basically. So uh, from the package file, it gets the global variables and uh, initializes some, some uh, uh, global stuff. Then it, it reads the package YAMLs, and it finds out the build instructions in these package YAMLs. And it passes these instructions as LLB uh, to build kit. So what is LLB? LLB is a low-level build. Uh, intermediate language that's a binary actually format that BuildKit understands, and uh, um, then you can pass it to BuildKit and it builds its own uh, dependency graph and it builds it in parallel. So, the benefit of actually outputting LLB directly instead of, uh, let's say, building a Docker file is we are not limited by what Docker file offers. So, uh, actually, uh, there are some Cool features of LLB that is only offered, uh, I mean, not offered in Docker file. They're not exposed through Docker files. Directly giving LLB input to BuildKit uh, brings some advantages there. And uh, at the end, it exports artifacts as container images. Uh, like, it is basically like Docker build x build command. What, what it does, it's, it's a similar story. And uh, every build, like when we are building tools that depends on tool chain, the build environment is the previously built, uh, is the tool chain in that case. So every single time we are building something, we use the previous artifact as the build environment itself. So we build in the container. And when you build in a container, actually a lot of problems just simply disappear. Like it is like kind of better version of change root, let's say, uh, that you have this isolated 
a consistent build environment, so the problems with paths and so on, they disappear. So let's, let's look at how the package file looks, uh, the package file that Builder takes as input. So there are some hints uh, at the top uh, about the version it should use, and then uh, some variables that are used. So most of the variables are the versions of the packages and their hashes. So uh, they are used to actually download the source, uh, source code. Um, in the package YAMLs, uh, these variables are used in templates, let's say. And at the bottom, you can see there are some um, metadata about the produced um, container image. And the package YAML is where it gets a bit more interesting. So how we build software is basically this, this file is processed by builder and uh, finally, at the end, we get, we get that, that thing built. So on the left, you can see the directory structure. Uh, I took IPMI tool as an example. We use it in a couple of places, not in Talos, but uh, some other software. So uh, as you see, there are some dependencies section here, and it depends on base and open SSL. And uh, it uses these variables that were defined in the, in, in the package file, in, like version, and it downloads it, it downloads the source, and then it verifies that its hashes are matching. Here we have some environment variables. We pass this uh, source state epoch to, well, there are some things to make some software uh, built reproduce in a reproducible way. Uh, one of them is this source state epoch. If the build is already aware of that environment variable, it's the timestamp that it uses um, in places so that uh, the final artifact is reproducible. Actually, by the way, this, this is redundant because we uh, set it also at a higher level, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, we should just delete it. And in the prepare section, we just uh, extract the downloaded artifact and uh, we patch it. So here's an interesting thing. We have to, uh, in some software, we have to patch the source code to make uh, the reproducibility possible. Here, for example, in IPMI uh, case, uh, during the build, it downloads a file. It downloads this file called Enterprise Numbers. Uh, it's an IANA standard something. And this file changes over time. So we don't want that. So on the left, you can see that we actually put the file there statically. And we have a patch that I'm going to show its content in the next slide. But that patch is basically replacing the URL in the build uh, build instructions to actually use the file instead of that URL. So yeah, we just uh, configure and then in the install section we do make, uh, uh, make install and then we move it from where it, the directory it was built to the, to the root of, that, of the container. And here we also do some more stuff to actually uh, fix the timestamps of the produced files. So these are all just to get it reproducible. Uh, the patch looks like this. So as you see, instead of this URL, we replace it with our file uh, reference so that we don't hit that issue. And uh, that was Builder. Uh, I'm going to also talk a bit about Cress. Cress is another uh, in-house tool of ours, and it, it, it allow, it, it's a tool to scaffold projects, basically. Uh, so all our project structure, directory structure, and the files look uh, very similar, uh, except one file called CRES.yaml, where you define actually uh, the stuff that CRES understands, and then most of the things are generated. So it, it, it is mainly used to build Go projects. It's, it has most functionality related to Go. And uh, the thing is, like when we start a project, we bootstrap it with CRES once, and then it creates a make target to regress the project. So when, you, when we do make regress, it updates, uh, it updates build kit version, it updates uh, a lot of things uh, that are used, and it brings the new features that, that were uh, introduced to the tool. So it takes care of uh, generated code like protobuf definitions. It passes the right build flags to Go compiler. It creates the CI workflows, uh, GitHub actions, drawn, and so on. 
and uh, it, it generates a make file and a Docker file, and make file is basically uh, calling, for, for most build targets, it's calling Docker build x build, and then uh, giving the Docker file. So again, we use uh, build kit in our regular, uh, not only in our tooling, but also in each and every uh, end software of ours. So it also generates linters and coverage configuration and so on. So uh, an example of it is on the left side, uh, you see that the, the, the Crest YAML basically, you, you drop this in your project root and uh, you tell about uh, which platforms it should build for and uh, the files it should generate, which should be the, what should be the location and so on, how should it release it and so on. And on the right side is, is the directory structure that it generates. So Cress actually uh, helps us to, it, it uh, enforces, uh, let's say, a discipline of uh, always building in a consistent manner and uh, not detaching from it and introducing possible things that uh, compromise reproducibility in our build. So it is kind of our uh, enforcer of uh, these kind of things. Uh, also, it supports reproducibility directly in some uh, cases, like uh, if you give, uh, as you see here, if, if you have this in your Crest file, let's say, you are basically telling that the, the, the tools uh, build target should be reproducible, and it generates two things. It generates a weekly uh, GitHub Actions uh, pipeline um, that uh, tests the reproducibility, and it, uh, to, to do that, it generates also in make file a make target that basically builds the same thing twice, build A and build B, but on the second build, it uh, doesn't use the cache uh, because when you build things in containers using build kit, second time you build it, everything will be cached and it will basically do nothing. So in the second build, we build without cache, and then we compare these two builds using Defoscope and fail if it's, they are different. So let's talk about the known issues and the, the future work we might do. Uh, there's uh, about the kernel that I, I told that um, uh, I was about to talk about. So uh, kernel is not reproducible because we, uh, we basically sign kernel modules uh, with a key and uh, the kernel uh, has the public part of that key, so the kernel only loads the, the modules that were signed by this key. Uh, it's called module signature verification. And when we uh, do that, uh, the, the key that we use to sign these modules uh, are actually a throwaway key. So in the CI, when we are building kernel, we create this key pair, sign the modules, put the public part to the kernel, but uh, at the end of the build, that, that private key goes away. So uh, that, that build of kernel will only load the modules that were built together with it. So this is uh, actually uh, a trade-off that we accept because we want uh, Talos to be secure, first of all, and uh, we chose to not allow the modules to be loaded uh, that doesn't have our signature. You could, of course, build your own, take and build your own and do whatever you want, but the ones that we distribute are signed by us. Um, this does not make uh, Talos non-reproducible, uh, actually, because uh, Talos is basically init RAMFS image. And uh, as soon as you, you, as long as you use the same uh, kernel build, same packages built, basically, uh, it will use the same kernel and same module, so, uh, uh, it, like, you can build Talos in ETHRMFS repeatedly and it will always uh, result in the same, uh, same uh, image. Uh, we have the same issue with uh, Secure Boot, uh, UKI basically, uh, Trusted Boot. Uh, it is because it's signed, uh, it is not reproducible. So again, something that we, we are aware, but we uh, take it as a trade-off. Another problem is the bootstrapping. Basically, to build a chain of trust, you need to start by trusting someone, someone external. Uh, in, the, uh, in the build graphs, to tool graphs, you, you've seen that uh, we take some stuff from Alpine Linux, like making patch and so on, 
Uh, and uh, we, using these uh, tools, we actually rebuilt them to uh, use them uh, later. So we build make, and then we switch to using our make. Uh, but we start with Alpine's make. And uh, even when we pin the Alpine version, uh, it doesn't actually really help. Because uh, um, even when you pin the Alpine version, the packages in the, the, in the Alpine's uh, package manager get still bumped, so they don't keep the old packages forever. Uh, so we are aware of this problem, and there are potential solutions that we want to address, uh, do sometime, and uh, one is, uh, there are some Debian-based images, as far as I know, where you can pin packages and they will just forever <laughs> be there. Uh, we could switch to using that, or we can use, uh, switch to uh, using our previous builds as the base image, so we just build once and then we uh, do dog fooding, basically, and uh, address this problem. Uh, and also one, one another issue is we, um, our disk images are not reproducible uh, because the file system uh, potentially differs across builds. When we, when we build a disk image, uh, depending on the host kernel version, even if we build it in a container, depending on the host kernel version, uh, it, it might write the files differently to this, to this mounted disk image, uh, even if it's the same file system and everything. Uh, so depending on the host kernel's uh, file system driver or something like that. Another thing is the file creation dates, uh, like uh, they differ and there is no easy way to actually uh, change mod them or something like that. So uh, because of that, our disk images are currently not reproducible, but we have uh, ideas for solutions like if you pin the host kernel version, we address one of the problems. And uh, another, way, uh, another problem with the file creation dates. So um, there's a way to pass uh, something called protofile to make FS XFS, for example, to, to say that create exactly like into this file system, exactly put these files with this metadata and so on. It might help to address the creation date problem. But uh, there can be other solutions as well. We just didn't explore that. Uh, yet, but uh, we want to also address this at some point. So, yeah, that was it. Any questions? I got a whole list, so if others have uh, ones, feel free to stop me in the middle. Uh, first question I had was, uh, do you guys have a mono repo for a lot of your code? Like, you know, yeah, I guess that's the first question. Like in your, all your packages, is that all one Git repo or is that multiple? Uh, so actually we have, we don't use mono repo. We have, uh, Talos is a separate repo. Omni is a separate repo. These main two are of our main products. And this one, the overview, uh, every single uh, high level uh, piece is, is, a, is a repo on its own. So tool chain is a repo, tools is a repo and so on. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, next one is more of a comment, by the way. So I was having a discussion um, around the, the kernel module key bit. Um, and if you notice, like when we were doing compose a fast, yeah. we had an original model where we wanted to, yeah, basically link up the kernel UKI with the real root. And we realized basically the kernel module signature is just a way to bind kernel files to the kernel. And so you know what Chrome OS does is they use load pin, which is basically a way to require the kernel, when it loads a module, it came from a DM Verity volume, right? Mm -hmm. And that allows you to, like, so basically if you verify the root of us, you don't need another key to bind the kernel and the modules, right? Like, because you have a mm. key that's binding the UKI to the root, so I'm just saying you can get rid of the kernel module signing. So yeah, that, that sounds promising. Actually, yeah, if you have some other good ideas also about this, uh, how to get the best of both worlds on that front with kernel, also make kernel reproducible, but still keep these uh, modules uh, secure. I'm all open for it. Just find and talk, talk to me about it. Yeah. Uh, so next one, this was one's more of a spicy question, but it's a friendly one. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of build systems out there, right? And like, yeah. you guys put a lot of work, it looks good, but, you know, if you look at it, there's a bunch of options, right? So one obvious one, since you're already depending on Alpine, is basically 
make Alpine packages of all your stuff. Like there's already build systems for that. And then you, you know, like ChainGuard has Melange, which like stitches together Alpine packages into a container image, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of people do, I think, in this space. So I guess, yeah, that's my, well, and also there's, you know, Bazel and Buck. There's a lot of build systems out there. So I guess, yeah, that's my spicy question is like, do you feel you got, I, it's cool what you invented. Like, do you feel like it had just helped you versus like, you know, looking at other options? Yeah, it did uh, because uh, so I wasn't there at Sidero when this uh, the the whole builder thing started. But builder was one of the first projects to actually uh, leverage build kit and pass this LLB to it. So it was one of the first. It really rode that wave of uh, uh, build kit starting to be be a thing, and we, we were one of the first. So we are even listed in these uh, projects uh, in the README page of build kit that actually using it as 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 the build tool. So now there are more alternatives, but at that time, building in containers was just addressing lots of problems, and build kit just, I think it just felt like the right tool, and yeah, from its early days, we just adopted it. That makes sense. Build kit is cool. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, uh, one more. How long does your build yeah, process okay. take? Ah, so. Uh, in my, so the whole the whole chain I think takes will take a few hours. Uh, I cannot give you some exact numbers, but for example, when I build tools without cache, like a cold build in my 24 core home PC, it takes nine minutes. Uh, but tools does not contain kernel packages will maybe contain uh, take like uh, half an hour or something like that. But I really don't have exact numbers, so they're just kind of guesses. All right, thank you to Utku. Thank you. Thank you very much.